Please take your place in our church. Just take your place, Lord. Have your way, Lord. Blessed be God. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' mighty name, we have worshipped. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Awesome God. Choir God bless you. Awesome Jesus. Awesome Jesus. Today we're looking at the topic the making of a disciple. Everybody say the making of a disciple. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of today. We thank you for guarding us throughout the perils of the night. And we thank you for bringing us to church this morning to hear your word. We've spent time praising your name. And now, oh God, we're going to go a little further in your word. We pray for insight. We pray for revelation. You've given unto us the topic, the making of a disciple. We are all disciples of Jesus. And so, Lord, teach us what we need to know as disciples of Christ, so that we can really, truly be his disciples. Thank you, Lord God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Good to see you, to see you good. Thank you. So today we're looking at a text, John 13, 13 to 16. John 13, 13 to 16. That's going to be our main text for today. And I'm going to read it. Ye call me Master and Lord. And ye say, well, for so I am. If I then be your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash the feet of another, ought to wash another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. How many of us have been students? You know? How many of us have ever been a teacher? You've taught somebody before. You've taught somebody something, whether professionally or whether voluntarily you've taught somebody you know we're all teachers you know so so the school teaching teaching your children so we've all taught now listen to me everybody the real true joy of a teacher is when the students pay attention when they're being taught so jesus is saying to them here why are you calling me master another word for master is teacher why are you calling me teacher And then I thought, why would he say to them, why are you calling me teacher? Why are you calling me master? And then God said to me, Lola, what is the true joy of every teacher? The true joy of every teacher is when their students in class are paying attention, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If you walk into your class, whichever year you're teaching, and the whole place is rowdy, and they're not listening, or maybe they're on their phone, or maybe they're chatting to one another, or maybe they're whispering to one another, you're... As a teacher, you don't like it. So the first joy of a teacher is the students are paying attention. And then the other joy of a teacher is that students are following instructions. You know, because do you know that every teacher has been assessed? So if every child in their class fails, that teacher is not happy because it means that something is wrong. So the teacher wants the students to follow instructions. So Jesus, as a teacher, as the master wants us to pay attention to him and he wants us to follow his instructions. What else do we do brings joy to a teacher in our world? The teacher wants the students to study because there is going to be a test. There is going to be an exam. The teacher wants the student to study. Jesus also wants us to study. 
Study your environment. Study the word. Study yourself. Do you know that the minute as a disciple you master yourself, you know yourself, you're on your way. Someone was saying earlier today, oh, if I have an issue with anger, what do I do? I take it to God and I pray about it. That means that person has studied themselves. To know that, look, I have a, I have a problem in this area. Hmm. Let me go and seek the face of somebody who can rescue me. So a good student will study. A good student will go over the notes and revise it. That is what God expects of us as disciples. A good student will excel in their exams. That is going to be the real proof that they have studied. You know, you know there's what they call crash program. <laughs> How many of us have done crash program? You know what I mean by crash program? Oh, you don't know. Ah, oh, you are a good student. You know, some really bad students, you know, the night before. You want to finish a whole curriculum the night before. So by the time you enter the exam hall, you're like a zombie. You're like a zombie, and you're just going in. Sister Tayo says, says, good money. You say, no, sorry, I can't talk because I have crammed so much in this brain that I don't want anything to fall in the wrong place. So you go in, and then two minutes after the exam, you can't even remember anything you meant. I mean, I mean, I've been there before. Okay, I'm, I, so maybe I'm the only. Oh, so you, if you don't understand it, that means you, you're a good student. Some of us have been there. By the time your eyes will be like this, like they're going to pop because you have just crammed it. In fact, you haven't slept a wink. You have not slept. That is not a good student. A good student will study. You pace yourself. You study every day. Don't say by Bible reading as a good disciple. It's only going to be on Sunday. You'll be like that student that did cram. Because life is going to bring an examination. How many people know that life examines you? Mm-hmm. And the examination can come anytime. It could be when you are at the bus stop that the examination will come. It could be when you are in your house. It could be when you are at work. It could be when you are even in church. Examination can come. Maybe you are going for a church program and you can see 20 seats in front. And the usher says, move in. You know, I know some of us we like to sit at the end. The usher says, sit. Don't sit at this end. Please move in so that you know, it is easy to go in. And then you will see this person standing there, arguing and fighting with the usher. I came early. How can I be sitting here, you know, and the person who is going to come after me will sit at the end seat? They don't know that it's an examination. It could be an exam. The exam, there will be no notice given. You will just be assessed. And that is why we must constantly be studying, constantly be attentive to what's going on around us as a good disciple. Every teacher wants their students to learn something. You know? You study, you learn from it. There's no use reading the Bible if you're not going to learn anything. You said you read the whole book of Genesis. I said to you, what lessons have you learned? You said, ah, nothing. There's nothing new. Ah, ah. The word of God must be new to you as a good student. You must learn something. Something more, you know, like when we, when we were doing, um, um, what's it, what we call it, through the Bible. You know, we're saying, oh, um, what jumps out at you? Every time you read the word of God, something must pop out. That, oh, this is a fresh revelation. Because it is not the letter that God is interested in, the words. It's the revelation that you and I get from it. So as a good student, you must have a revelation. Something new, something fresh from the word of God. That is the joy of every teacher. And that's why in our text today, Jesus Christ said, Why are you calling me master? Why are you calling me master? Why are you calling me master? That was what he was saying to them. Why are you calling me master? Okay, it's great you call me teacher. But I want you to learn. Now look at Matthew 11, 29. Matthew 11, 29. It says, take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. For I am meek, I am lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Jesus says, I am meek. I am lowly. I am meek. I am humble. I am disciplined. I am self-control. Every teacher wants every student to be like them. 
because the teacher has excelled to the point whereby they can teach you the subject. So maybe it's in maths. They're a professional in that field. They want you to be like them or even better than them. There are some students that are better than their lecturers. Every teacher wants that. That wow. Have you, have you answered the question in class before and your lecturer looked at you and they just, they, they just smile. You know, they just look at you and they wonder, my, 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 that is something. That is what every teacher wants. And Jesus, as a teacher as well, wants the same thing, that wow, where did that come from? You know, there was a time Peter was before him and then he was saying to the disciples, who do people say I am? Some people say, well, some people say you are Jeremiah, some say you are Moses, some think that maybe you are even Judas, I mean, not Judas, uh, what's this guy's name? John the Baptist, uh -huh. you know, people are saying uh, different things. And then they say, okay, who do you say I am? And there was a pause, because it was an examination time. Who do you say I am? Do you have a revelation of who I am? And then Peter, the bold one, the one who always likes to go forward and speak first. Sir, you are the son of the living God. What did Jesus Christ say? I'm sure he must have looked at him and smiled and said, Wow! Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. Wow! That is awesome. That is the way every teacher wants their student to be. To have an insight and revelation of him. So as good students, as disciples, remember the topic is the making of a disciple. You are going to understand your teacher. Who is the teacher? Who is the teacher? Ah, we are, who is the teacher? Jesus is the teacher. All of us are quiet. Okay. Who is the teacher? Jesus. Jesus. Who is the examiner? Us. Yeah. The devil. Who is the examiner? The devil. The devil is the examiner. God is not the examiner. The devil is the examiner. That is why he can bring the test for you. Anytime. Do you think he wants you to pass? No. He will bring it to you anytime. He may be while you're lying on your bed and you're on a phone call <laughs> and somebody is just rubbing you the wrong way. The examiner is at hand. So as good disciples, please remember the teacher is Jesus Christ. He will use anything, his word, circumstances, people around us to teach us. But the examiner is the devil. And he can come knocking anytime. In fact, he can come to your best friend. He can come to your husband or wife. He can even come to your children. He can come to your colleague. He can come to a stranger on the street. He can come to a driver. You know, I don't know, uh, but I will, you, dr you drive. Uh, he can come through passengers that are from hell. And you know that this one just wants to make my day miserable. And I'm sure you know, you know the passengers like that. Because I've been on buses before. And I see the way some people just... And I'm like, man, that bus driver must be extremely patient. Because this person is just a nuisance. And there are people like that. So every, they can come anywhere and they don't give you notice. They won't say, we are coming, joy. We are coming in two hours. No, they just pounce on you because the examiner is a devil. And he has agents everywhere. And that's why as good students, as good disciples, we must be what they call ever-ready battery. The ever-ready. I mean, people know the ever-ready battery. Not the ones that don't have a name. You know, there are some that are called ever-ready. You know, Duracell. Always on point, always working. Not the ones that you buy a pound shop. You know, you put it in for five, five, five hours, and the thing is dead. Mm -mm. So you must be ever ready. Praise the name of the Lord. So he says, learn of me. First John two six. First John two six. He says, he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk, even as he has walked. So if we say we abide in Jesus, if we say we are Jesus' people then we need to do exactly what Jesus has done, how he walked, what he, how he would talk, how he would think, how, what he would do. That's exactly what we want to do. The joy of every teacher is that they want a student they can be proud of. How many parents have been to, you know, award, award ceremony? Ah, and then they, they, they reel out, you know, they say in a class of 50, and then they say they want to give best student award. 
and then they now call your child's name. My goodness, how would you feel? How many people have been there before? They call your child's name, and you have been me. In fact, there was once I went, I was, I think my smile must have been so much. People must have been wondering. I smiled. Not only did I smile, I had my camcorder ready, recording, and I was shouting. And it did not matter that they were, you know, I went for a madness and graduation ceremony. When they call names, you know, because it's a Caucasian environment, when they call names, everybody was quiet. And I'm like, I have a problem with this. Because when they call my son's name, I'm not going to be quiet, I'm going to scream. So they were calling names, calling names, and then when they got to my son's turn, when as soon as they called, they said, We just scream, yeah! Well done! People looked at us. But guess, but guess what? After we did that one, every other name they called. People, it was as if people were not sure whether they were allowed to shout or not. I said, ah, this is only not once. Ah, this this event is not going to come again unless it's another degree. This one, like that we are here. Ah, I shouted so much they looked at me and said, ah, I'm here. Yeah, sorry, because that black woman, that African woman. I said, I don't care. You know, that is the joy of every teacher. Mm-hmm. That you you want you know a prodigy that you will, that you have produced that is making you proud and Jesus also wants to do the same with us you know the making of a disciple he wants to be proud of us that wow you scored a goal you know that's what he wants so let's go out of this place and study as good students and make our teacher Jesus proud and make the examiner to be ashamed. You know, made the examiner to be ashamed that ah, you thought I was going to fail. Shame on you. I have passed this test. How many people are going to go out like that? Amen. God is going to give us the grace to do so. Amen. And then he said to them, Why call me Lord, Lord? Why are you calling me Lord? Look at Luke 6 46 to 49. It's okay. You are calling me Lord. Great. You are giving me respect. Great. But why are you calling me Lord? Let's see what it says in Luke 6, 46 to 49. Luke 6, 46 to 49. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without that without a foundation built an house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. He says, why are you calling me Lord if you're not going to do what I say? Remember, he was talking to the disciples, the making of a disciple. You call me teacher, then you must be good students. You call me Lord, Lord, then you must do what I tell you to do. Otherwise, it is pointless calling me your Lord. Jesus said also in Luke 22, 25 and 26, Luke 22, 25 and 26. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as, the, as he that doth serve. He says, that among in the, in the world that we live in today, the greater is the one that sits down, and the younger is the one that serves, the one that sits. He says, but a good disciple is not the one that is going to sit down and wait for somebody to wait upon them. Who is a good disciple? A good disciple is the one that is going to get up and serve. Not sitting down to be waited upon. So what are you doing to serve? It's a question. What are you doing to serve? Who are you serving? That's where a good disciple is. And God says he wants all of us 
to be disciples. So we're not sitting down for anybody to come and spoon feed us or do things for us. No, we are actually getting up and serving. He says in the world, we have so many bosses. Everybody wants to be a boss, but there are very few leaders. Well, who is a boss and who is a leader? A boss tells you what to do. A leader shows you what to do. And they're two different things. A boss will tell you what to do. They don't have to do it. That's a boss. But a leader will show you what to do. How? They will show you by example. So he says, he says the rulers in the world, they are bosses. They are not leaders. They lord it over people. They tell them what to do. That was the problem Jesus had with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He says they give people a long yard of assignments and stuff to do, but no, they won't even do anything with one little finger. They were not leaders by examples. And God is saying to us, as a good disciple, we must be leaders by example. How can you get people to follow you? It is by example. If I say, for instance, now, we want to do fundraising in the church, we want to buy a pulpit, for instance, the pulpit is going to cost 1,000 pounds, and I'm going to put down 200 pounds. What have I done? I have led by example, and I have set the ball rolling. But if I say we want to give 1,000 pounds, and two weeks' time, I'm telling you, uh, there's still no money in the, in the thing. Nobody has contributed. You're going to be thinking, you that set this thing, how much have you put down? But the minute I say I have put 200 pounds down, what will happen? It would encourage somebody to say, okay, let me, yeah, I can't do 200, but let me do 150. Or let me do 50, let me do 100. Do you understand? Because I have led by example. So the best way to lead to guide people as a disciple, because it's not just about us being disciples, it's about us raising disciples, people that are also going to follow Christ because of what they see in us. We have to be good examples. And the Lord will make us good examples in Jesus' mighty name. First Peter 5, 2-3. First Peter 5, 2-3. As a good disciple of Christ, it says, feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. The best way to lead the flock is not by trying to force them. As a parent, the best way to lead your child, do you know it? Is by example. As a teacher, the best way to lead your student is by example. The teachers in the house, remember when you had your training and the trainer was saying, oh, she arrived before all of you guys. She said, so as good teachers, as your example, what are you, you know, it is not what you see. It is what you do that is the thing. So if you say you are a teacher and you arrive one hour late, that means you are a lousy teacher. Because your students are in the class waiting for one hour for you to arrive. You're not a teacher. So the next time one of your students comes late, what are you going to say to them? You have no mouth to talk. Because they know that you are a late comer. You have no mouth to talk. Do you understand? We are disciples. And we are supposed to be living by example. Jesus Christ wasn't telling disciples what to do. He was just showing them. So he wanted them to learn lessons on humility. What did he do? He took a bowl of water. He told everybody to come with their dirty, ugly, you know, looking feet. He sat down and he washed their feet. And I'm sure that, you know, that for him to wash their feet, he would have had to kneel down. They would have been above him. He had to go all the way down to wash the feet and wipe it. He didn't tell them, be humble. He showed them an example of what it is to be humble. That is what a good disciple must be. 
a good disciple, if you want to lead, the Bible says, you must have oversight of the flock. And I hope you know that everybody has a flock. You have it. Everybody has a flock. Even the children, you have a flock. As little as, as our lovely brother over there is. He has people that are looking up to him. I hope you know that. In the nursery, whatever he does, some children will want to copy and do. I hope you know that. So everybody has a flock. Even our little brother here. Every, everybody, you will not believe it. Everybody has a flock. It's not just about big people. When I say a flock, somebody that is looking at you. Oh, he picked up that toy and he smiled. You know, children, they will copy each other. Oh, and then they'll pick up the toy and they will smile as well. Oh, he got up and they ran to that corner to do something. What would they do? They would get up, run to that corner. Without knowing, he already has a flock. He has a, he's a pastor and some people are already following him. That's the way life is. And the Bible says we must be mindful of what we do because of the people who are copying us. We have oversight of a flock. So whether you are a mother, you are a father, an auntie, an uncle, even as a sister, maybe you are the eldest, the younger ones coming behind you are your little flocks. You still have oversight. You have, you know, you have to lead them by good example. So if they see you as the older one, you know, maybe daddy says something and you shout back. What would the younger ones do? They will copy. So you can you imagine how and you didn't go and tell them to do the same. They're just simply going to copy what you do. And that's why we the Bible says we must have oversight. And then he says, you're not going to lead somebody by compelling them to do it. You're going to lead somebody by example. The best way to lead is by example. So I want my child to be a tighter, for instance. I have to be a tighter myself. I want my child to be truthful. I have to be truthful myself. Do you understand? It's not that, ah, why, why are you always lying? And the boy maybe is just afraid. I can't say to you that mommy, you too. <laughs> you, are, you are a liar too. Do you understand? Why are you telling me? They may, I mean, some people, some children will say it, but some people children will just require them. He's telling me not to lie. They lie. Yesterday you were you were in the house. And you, you told your friend that you are in the market. And the child, you know, says we have a flock. As disciples, let's be mindful of that. Don't do anything for dishonest gain. Don't do anything with ulterior motive. That's what that text is telling us. It says, not for filthy lucre. Don't try and take advantage of the people that you have oversight of. A, a good disciple won't do that. Jesus Christ never took advantage of the people he was leading. A true disciple must do these things and do it with the right motive. So as a good disciple, we're told in 1 Timothy 4, 12. In what areas can I be a good example? He says, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation. That word conversation means in your conduct, in your behavior, in love, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. What do you say? What do you do? How do you do it? Why do you do it? These are all important things. Jesus Christ said in Luke 6, 12, he went to a mountain top to pray and he continued all night in prayer. You know, he was setting, remember, everything Jesus Christ does, he's setting us examples. As a good disciple, you must have a prayer life. We are living in the last days. There are a lot of things that are going to be bigger than you and you're going to need to refer to the master in prayer to guide you. That is very key. Matthew 17, 21. Matthew 17, 21. It says, How be it? This kind goeth not by prayer and fasting. As a good disciple, you must have a good fasting life. Those are the examples Jesus Christ gave us. At the commencement of his ministry, he fasted. Fasting is important. It's not to kill you. Incidentally, the world, do you know that the world now is embracing fasting? I was sharing with you, a lot of my colleagues now, they are not even born again. They are not even churchgoers. And they are fast. They fast. Like, in fact, I don't even understand it. They will, they will police it. I'm fasting. Everybody's eating biscuits and sugar and tea and everything. They say, no, 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 no. I'm fasting. 
And then they will now say to you, not fasting for one day. One lady told me, I am fasting for three days. I said, what are you fasting for? She said, I just want to fast. For three days, no food. Just drinking liquid, liquid, no food. And they are coming to work. And I'm like, wow. A good disciple of Christ. Let's emulate Christ. Let's do what he did. Please, let's rise up. John 13, 17 says, If you know these things and do them, happy are ye if you do them. Let's go before God and begin to pray.